the whole congregation of Israelites complain against Moses and Aaron. God, through Moses and Aaron, had delivered the Israelites miraculously from bitter slavery and ruthless oppression in Egypt. And now they've been trudging south along the coast of the peninsula down to the tip of the Sinai Peninsula. For a month, they have been battling survival in this inhospitable desert environment. And they're beginning to think that being a slave in Egypt was a lot safer than this risky freedom here in the wilderness. And their bellies are empty and they're kind of growling. And it's been a month since they have been able to sit beside meat pots and eat their whole fill of bread. And so they are moaning and complaining to Moses and to Aaron. And God hears the grumbling. And he comes up with a plan to send them all the nutrition that they need. But God does it in a way that's going to test them. He does it in a way that's going to teach them about a new pattern of food distribution. God is going to send quail in the evening, and in the morning there will be manna. Manna is described as a fine, flake-like substance. It's white like coriander seed and has the taste of honey. Although it's called bread from heaven, I picture it more like God's cornflakes or total because it has all of the daily nutrients in it. They learned that they were to collect just one omer of these flakes per person. That's about one to two liters. Everyone receives just enough. And if they try to save some to the next day, it rots. This is God's big lesson. In Egypt, the wealthy built storehouses of food, food that was grown and harvested by the slaves. And human, that, taught, that kind of culture taught them about hoarding and about competition, and human lives were broken because they needed to fuel the hunger of the elite. But here in the wilderness, they're dependent on God's cornflakes. And they learn a new culture that's founded on trust in God and in justice, a sharing of all their resources equitably. They're learning about trust and justice. Hunger is a life crisis <coughs> that's addressed over and over again in Bible. Listen to this cry from the Book of Lamentations. Happier were those pierced by the sword than those pierced by hunger whose life drains away when they're deprived of the produce of the field. And a psalmist describing the plight of the refugee writes, some wandered in the desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives were ebbing away. And Jesus recognized hunger in the thousands who came to hear him preach and teach. A word search on hunger and hungry turns up over 70 references. And God suffers with those that hunger and thirst and feel their lives ebbing away. Throughout the Bible, the stories of hunger are immediately followed by stories of God's solution. God sends manna to the Israelites as they journey through the wilderness. And much, much later in the history of the Israelites, when they're exiled to Babylon and they thought it would be better to be pierced by the sword than to die of hunger, God shows them how to adapt to life in Babylon, how to plant crops, and how to rebuild their houses. God directs the wandering refugees that the psalmist wrote about to a city where they settled. And Jesus instructed the disciples to feed the 5,000. He took the five loaves that the disciples gave them, and he looked to heaven with the loaves and the fishes, and he blessed the food, but then he gave it to the disciples to distribute. And the thousands of people there each had enough to eat. When people trust God and listen to God, when they turn their lives around and follow God, 
then God helps them find justice. Now, sometimes God works through those great miracles, but most of the time God works through ordinary people and circumstances. God expects us to be part of the solution. This morning, when we read the parable in the Gospel of Matthew that teaches us that we are to be partners in God's plan of trust and justice. Listen again to the good news. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. And I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. And I was a stranger, and you invited me in. And I needed clothes, and you clothed me. And I was sick, and you looked after me. And I was in prison, and you came to visit. And then the people ask him, Lord? When did we see you were hungry and fed you? When did we see you were thirsty and gave you a drink? When did we do these things? And the king replies, I tell you, whenever you do this to the least of my brothers and sisters, you did it for me. We also have a great passage in John's Gospel that teaches us about our responsibility to be part of God's plan. It's in John 21. And the risen Christ asks Peter, do you love me? And Peter replies emphatically, yes, Lord. And then Christ says, feed my sheep. He says, feed my lamb, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep. Christ was very clear about our responsibility. How are we doing? What does hunger look like in the 21st century? More than a billion people are hungry right now, right today, throughout the world. And I don't mean hungry like I didn't have time to have breakfast before I came to church hungry. <coughs> I mean malnourished, so tired I can't think straight. I have no clue where my next meal is coming from hungry. They're hungry because a drought has burned away their crops. They're hungry because civil conflict, war, has disrupted their agriculture and destroyed their food delivery system. They are hungry because they don't have access to education that would teach them how to be better farmers or how to have proper nutrition or how to avoid disease. They are hungry because, for reasons that are more hidden that we don't like to even think about, for example, because there's an increase for biofuel, it means that more land is being used to grow crops of corn, soya bean, and palm oil instead of growing crops of diversified foods. Or the way that wealthy countries lend money to developing countries, increasing their national debt to a level where that starts to take away from the resources that actually could meet the people's needs. I think I've been talking too theoretically. I want to make this more concrete for you. Hunger isn't measured in numbers. It's measured in people. So listen to these voices of the people. Being poor is always being tired from Kenya. Lack of work worries me. My children were hungry and I told them the rice was cooking until they fell asleep from hunger from a parent in Egypt. It wasn't my turn. This was the response of a United States child who had fallen asleep at school when asked if he had eaten breakfast this morning. It wasn't his turn. We could become hopeless in the face of a problem as huge as world hunger. But we do have the resources to tackle it when we partner with God and when we partner with agencies like the World Church World Service. The money that we're going to collect on the 25th by walking in the crop walk is going to be used to respond to emergencies like the floods and hurricanes that we just had or the fires in Texas. It's going to be used to assist, or it's already there, they're already assisting refugees, the people that have come out of Somalia and settled in Ethiopia. It's going to go to initiatives of education, innovation, enterprise, and collaboration, which is just a fancy way of it's going 
to teach the people how to feed themselves and give them better distribution systems so that they can succeed. And it's going to feed the people now, the people who are hungry now. It's going to give water to the people who are thirsty now. When we walk in the North Arundel Crop Walk on September 25th, 25% of the money is going to stay here. It's going to go to the North County Emergency Outreach Network, which is commonly known as NEON. NEON is 36 of our local neighborhood churches gathered together <laughs> along with six civic organizations, and they address food security, they help with emergency utility pavements, they do counseling, and there's programs for the homeless. I think that you've most come into contact this win in your winter homeless program. When we walk in the crop walk, we will be making strides at overcoming world hunger in our community and around the globe. Now, I don't want this to be a sermon on crop walk or the world church service. I just lift up these organizations because these are the organizations that we're working with this month. But we'll be working with others throughout the year and with our own United Methodist connections to make a difference in world hunger. I want you to see that it is God that works through us so that all of God's children are fed. I want you to see that through trust in God that food can be distributed in a just way so that all have enough. This week, I didn't know James was going to be in church. I thought he was going to be gone by now, but this week, James Van Orden came to Bible study with Beth Ann. They had just got back from helping the people in North Carolina recover from the flood of, and hurricane of Irene. And James said, he painted this picture, he said, he, the people there, they can't wait for the insurance companies to replace all their stuff. And FEMA can't get around quickly enough to give everybody a safe place to live. The people are dependent on the love of neighbor to help out. And so what they see there, what he described there was um, the people who could cook were cooking meals. And the able-bodied volunteers were removing the debris. And the people who had skills, like James, who's a carpenter, were helping to rebuild. Love, faith, hope united the locals and the people that had come in from out of state to work on God's recovery plan for the area. When he told me this, when he told me of trucks being donated and tools being donated, I realized what I was hearing, what they had participated in, was the kingdom of God here and now. We don't always get to see that. It's like when you can just peel a crack, just, just open it for a bit, and you can see when everybody's working together, you can see the love of God, you can see God's plan coming to where it's supposed to be. When the Israelites were moaning and grumbling in the desert, Moses had them turn away from Egypt. He had them turn away from the past, and he had them face east into the wilderness and their future. And that's where they saw the glory of the God in a cloud. They looked into their hard times and saw God's hope. And they, God gave them the bread of heaven to help them endure a living hell here on earth. James told us that faith and hope were the best gifts that volunteers could give to the hurricane survivors. Oh, they could live without stuff, they could get by with less food, they could live in temporary shelters. When they had faith, love, and hope, <coughs> those without hope seemed to be swallowed up by the circumstances. But those with hope had the courage to carry on. Holding on hope, they could turn their lives towards God's plan and place their trust there and work towards God's restoration and justice. And that's what we're asking you. What I hope you learn today is trust and justice. Amen. <laughs>